Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from our top secret broadcasting studio with another Watchman video broadcast. Uh, this is part five of our series, Another Jesus, Another Spirit, and Another Gospel, part two of Another Spirit. Let's go back uh, to sort of the beginning so we get our bearings. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, I want you to think about that serpent, through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. Now look at verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive, very important word here, another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. We talked in the last uh, several episodes about another Jesus uh, being preached. Now we're looking at another spirit. And I want you to notice that it was the serpent that beguiled Eve. And we know, according to the scripture, that this serpent was uh, Lucifer, who was uh, the anointed cherub that covereth. He was an angel in heaven, probably of the highest order in heaven, and he also is a spirit. So I want you to notice what the Bible's telling you, that it was a spirit that led Eve to the wrong conclusion. The spirit moved her, the Spirit spoke to her, the Spirit dealt with her. Much like the way the Holy Ghost will deal with uh, an individual, it will draw us, it will lead us, it will guide us. Um, the Holy Spirit will, will work through us and illuminate us, teaching us things that we need to know. The Bible talks about comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, and that is take one part of the Bible compare it to another part of the Bible because we know the Bible is a spiritual book. But that's sort of the essence of what a spirit does, is a spirit will draw or it will lead or a spirit will, will uh, display itself in a human by way of certain emotions. And people talk about, a, I have a spirit of joy, a spirit of gladness. That's what the Bible talks about. Uh, there are depressing spirits. There are oppressing spirits. Spirits that, and the word oppression, it has the word press in it. Spirits that will press on you to try to get you to do something, to try to get you, maybe as a husband or wife, to leave your spouse or minister to leave a church. I've had a spirit like that on me, not in me, but on me before, oppressing me, trying to get me to, to leave my congregation, to leave, leave my marriage, leave my family. Those things have happened before. That's not the Holy Spirit of God. It was another spirit. Those spirits can be received. And Eve listened, and she gave heed to the spirit that was with her in the Garden of Eden, which was Satan. And so we're using the Bible to try to identify how we can know. How, we, we talked about how we can know and understand whether it's the real Jesus or not. Now we're using the Bible to understand how we, can, how we can know what is the real Holy Spirit and what is another spirit that Paul said you have not received. Because a spirit will always have a manifestation of some kind in a person's, uh, in a person's character, their demeanor, uh, their actions, their attitude, their philosophies, and things like that. There's always going to be what the Bible refers to as fruit of the Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit, we know the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We already know what that is. Number one, it's Jesus Christ, because the Holy Ghost conceived inside of Mary, Jesus Christ. So she, he literally is the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, but we also have a description of that in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. There are nine things here. Nine is the number for fruit-bearing. woman bears a baby for nine months and so on. And so we know that the real Spirit of God will be manifested by, by way of these things. Love, when you love God, when you love God's people, when you love His Word, whereas you didn't used to before. 
I mean, we have people in our church that used to ridicule, mock Christianity, didn't want anything to do with it, and then the Lord began to deal with them. The Spirit began to move in them, and now they bear the fruit of the Spirit. They love preaching. They love the Bible. They love godly things. That's the difference between the Spirit that they used to follow, the Spirit, the Prince of the power of the air, the Spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, now they have a different spirit in them. So a spirit is always going to have a manifestation. If you look at the manifestation, you will be able and, and know what the Bible says, you'll be able to know what spirit it is. And, and it's actually, it's pretty simple. You'll be able to know and understand what spirit that is. So if we go back, same chapter in, in Galatians chapter five, if you look at uh, verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, I want to do something here that's something that we studied last week. Don't want to spend too much time in last week's study. But remember what Jesus said. He said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. And so we established last, last week that the real Spirit of God will always operate within the bounds of the Scripture or, and let me say this because there was a, a very well-written email that came in, uh, someone who wanted to understand what I was saying, the Spirit will always draw people, even sinners. Where, how, how does the Spirit work in a sinner's life? It draws them to the Scriptures so that they can read and understand the scriptures and be saved. And so when we say here in verse 16, this I say then walk in the spirit that you sh and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, we know that Jesus said the spirit and the word of God are interchangeable. They are one and the same. There is no difference between the written word of God, the inspired, inerrant, incorruptible seed of the word of God we know that the Spirit will work through that, through that book. So this I say then, walk in the Bible, the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that is true. I can tell you that that is absolutely true. A life grounded in the Word of God and spent time in the Word of God. Uh, I can't remember if it's D.L. Moody or somebody. The Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. And there it is right there. Walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And he says in verse 19, here's the works of the flesh, which are manifest. In other words, there is going to be, these represent the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And here are the manifestations of that spirit. This is very important because we left off last week talking about a spiritual phenomenon, a spiritual manifestation called slain in the spirit. As we read through the works of the flesh, I want you to ask yourself the question, does the manifestation of slain in the spirit, can it be seen in the works of the flesh? Listen, verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variants, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And what he's saying here is that you're only going to have one of two spirits. You cannot, people don't believe the lie that a lot of charismatics tell, oh, you're a born-again Christian, well, you can still be possessed by devils. It's not true. There's a throne inside of your heart. There's only room for one. And if the Holy Spirit dwells in you and you are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, the devil cannot sit on that throne. But the, and they'll tell you that, and it's a set-up doctrine is what it is. It's setting you up to, to believe lies is what it is. But here's the thing, you can only have one spirit in you. You are either going to be led by the Holy Ghost of God. Even if in the flesh you commit a transgression, 
of God's law by, by way of sin. The Holy Ghost then will lay upon you and, and put that guilt and that guilty conscience of you, and he'll work godly sorrow in you, the Bible says, and that will lead you to repentance. That's the real Spirit of God. But those who are inhabited or they have received another spirit, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, this is what their life is full of. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, and so on. In other words, the deeds of the spirit or the working of whatever spirit is in them will be made manifest. Now, we, we, we left off talking about this concept of the enlightenment of another spirit working through the pineal gland and so on, which is, you know, just right here behind the forehead, in, in the forehead, right where the mark of the beast is going. We talked about all these in Eastern mysticism. They refer to it as Shakti Pot, touching the forehead, getting a, a third eye open, the divine inner light. They speak of the the Christ consciousness, as it were. And here is a picture of Shakti. Notice that she is a spirit, but she is a female spirit, not the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus said in John 16 was he. This is she, or Shakti, or Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Two spirits. One is the masculine spirit of the Holy Ghost, shown to us, revealed to us plainly in the scripture as a he. And then we have Mystery Babylon the Great, a, a woman, a mother, the queen of heaven, Diana, uh, Ashtaroth, and so on. We're going to examine that spirit as we move forward in our study. But you have to ask yourself the question, um, where does the concept of slaying in the spirit come from? Number one, we've established that the Holy Spirit and its manifestations will always be biblical. It will always be in accordance with every word of God which is pure. So there is no doubt in my mind that as I'm reading through the scripture, if I, if I, would, if I would see in the early church, if I would see in the doctrines of Paul, Peter, James, John, uh, Jude, whoever, if I would see in these doctrines and in these teachings the concept of slain in the Spirit, I would believe it. I would preach it. I would teach it. I would tell everybody about it. I don't see it there. It's not there. It's not in the book of Acts. It's not in Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. It's not there. It doesn't exist. Where did it come from? And let's examine the idea of what it means to be slain in the Spirit. Slaying is murder. You are murdered in your spirit. And we talked about this in, um, in the part of where we were talking about the other Jesus the story in Freemasonry of the murder, the slaying of Hiram Abiff. And anybody who's a Mason, anybody that's told what goes on in the Masonic Lodge knows that in the first three degrees of Freemasonry, what they call the Blue Lodge, the initiate goes into this little ritual showing the murder, the slaying, by touching the forehead, receiving a wound in the forehead, which is exactly what Revelation 13 says about the beast. He has a deadly wound in his head, and that wound is healed. And so the, the story of Hiram of Abiff, the ritual, they actually played out. If you join the Masonic Lodge, you're going to be Hiram because you have to be initiated into this saying where you are slain, and now you are brought back to life. It's not in the Bible. And that's, what, that's where slain in the spirit comes from. It comes from that concept. And slain in the spirit means murdered. You are murdered in your spirit or you have, your spirit has been killed, murdered. Let's go back to what the Apostle Paul told us was the evidence of the manifestation of a flesh spirit. Galatians 5.21, envyings, murders, drunkenness. Let's stop right here. 
two manifestations. Number one, murder. That's not the Holy Spirit of God. God does not murder anybody. It violates his own commandments. God does not murder anybody. And murder means to take an innocent life. Drunkenness associated along with it. Stop and think about what slain in the spirit is. They come by, I had them do this to me, and God protected me. They come by me, I was at a, I was at a church where they practiced this. I was, it was at a time in my life, my younger years, I was looking for, I was thirsty for, for what God had. I found it here. Imagine that. But I went to this church, went down front, ladies behind me is going, dit, 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 just like that. I know that that's not biblical tongues. I know that she's out of course, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And then they come by me and they laid their hands on my head and, and kind of pushed back a little bit. And I stood there and nothing happened. So they went down the aisle and went down to all the people that was doing that. And I don't know if they fell or not. I had my eyes closed. Here they come back again. They got to do it a second time because the first time it didn't work. It didn't take. So they hit me again on the forehead and I didn't fall down. I didn't fall backward like Eli did when he heard the Ark of the Covenant had been taken out of the way. And so it didn't. God helped, protected me from that. But I know I've seen it. I've seen the skid enough to know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to fall backward. Now, some people just fake it. I understand that. But there are some people who actually, they go to sleep. They lose their conscience functions. They can't rationalize. They can't think. They have no control over their, over their physical movements, nothing. They're like a drunk person. And here's what we're going to establish. We're going to establish the idea that sleep and drunkenness are manifestations not of the real Spirit of God, but Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, who happens to have a cup in her hand. And she likes to have people drink of that cup, and it makes them drunk. So we see here in Galatians 5.21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such alike. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. And we established this last week. Where the real spirit of God is, there's light. There's daylight. Where the other spirit is, there's going to be darkness because people love darkness. And so they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunk are drunken in the night. The act or the activity of slain in the spirit causes one to lose their functions, lose their consciousness, lose their ability. They fall asleep. The Bible says that is equated with drunkenness and nighttime. It is not the real Spirit of God. Then look at Psalm 13, 3. Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God, lighten mine eyes, lest I, what? Sleep the sleep of death. Think about what the Bible's telling you. Lighten mine eyes. In other words, turn the light on. Lest I sleep the sleep of death. And remember, the pineal gland. The pineal gland is activated when the light turns off. And so here, here in, the, in the New Age movement, they're always telling you, oh, you got to have the pineal gland activated, and that, that brings you an awakening. No, it doesn't. It actually puts you to sleep is what it does. And what triggers the pineal gland to put you to sleep is darkness. So in the, in the action of this ritual called slain in the spirit, the person becomes dead, they've been murdered, they go to sleep, and they're in darkness and they're drunk, and they call it the Holy Spirit of God. And yet everything about this Bible says that when the Spirit comes upon you, it's light and not darkness. It is being awake and not asleep. And so here they've activated the pineal gland, and now you go to sleep. First Thessalonians chapter 5, the Bible is teaching us over and over and over again that we are not to be drunk. Let's go back. Let's look at this. Galatians 5.21. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. By the way, have you seen some of these church services on YouTube where they say the Spirit is coming in and there's pandemonium everywhere and people are laying all over the place laughing hysterically and barking? You know what that is? Go look up the word. That's a reveling. That's what it is. 
That is not the evidence of the Holy Spirit of God. The drunkenness, the murdered spirit, and the revelings are all part of the other spirit, Mystery Babylon the Great. So let's go look at exactly what the Bible says about whether you're supposed to be drunk or asleep. Because I had somebody tell me, well, it's obvious, Pastor Hargard, you've never been drunk in the spirit. Well, I'm glad it's obvious. I'm glad, I'm glad that this guy who told me that saw that in me. Never have, never will. Being drunk in the spirit is a different spirit. And if you've been there, you received it. It's not the Holy Spirit of God. Let's look at, well, I don't believe that. I, I know what I experienced. Okay, then you don't need this then, do you? No, because I'm getting revelation directly from God while I'm drunk. See, you don't need this anymore. The real Spirit of God draws men to this book, not away from it. You got the wrong spirit. First Thessalonians 5, verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. 1 Peter 1, 13, Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now I want to look at some things here. I'm going to stop right here. Number one, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. If, if, we, had, if we had guards, if, we, if, if a store hired a security company to guard their store or a bank to guard the bank, and the security guys showed up at night and they were already busted up drunk. And then as the night went on, they just drank more and they fell asleep. They're not watching anything. I could go in and break that bank and steal all that stuff out of there. They'd be fired and you know it. The Bible tells us to watch and be sober, not sleep and be drunk, as do others. You want to go to sleep? You want to be drunk? Fine. You're going to miss something. You're going to miss something that is absolutely eternally important. The coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ in 1 Peter chapter 1.13. He tells you to gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. He didn't tell you to be drunk so you could get it. He told you to gird up the loins of your mind. By the way, we're to gird up the loins. We're to wear the girdle of truth. Thy word is truth. It all goes back to the Bible. You know how to gird up the loins of your mind? Read the book. Read and understand and think on the words of God and be sober. If not, you'll miss the revelation of Jesus Christ and you will accept the other Jesus because the other spirit is going to drag you there while you're drunk because you can't walk on your own. First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now I want you to, I'm going to put these two things together here because eventually in this thing we're going to talk about contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer is nothing more than drunkenness, altered state of consciousness, asleep, hypnosis. You're not in control. But the Bible says that we're to be sober and watch unto prayer. Be sober not drunk. 1 Peter 5, 8. Here we go. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, I'm going to put a graphic up here on the screen here. I'm going to show you what I mean by, or what the Bible means by this. Y'all remember this, don't you? The Chronicles of Narnia. And we have a character that Clive Staples Lewis wrote into, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R.R.R.R.R. Tolkien were brandy-drinking philosophers who taught that the real Jesus could be understood by mythology. That's how J.R.R.R.R.R. Tolkien led C.S. Lewis, quote-unquote, to Christianity, was by telling him the myth of Osiris, the murdered, God, the dying God, you remember that one? and all these other things, and we talked about that Gandalf and so on. That's, that's how it happened. So C.S. Lewis's Christianity did not come from the scriptures. So he has a character by the name of Aslan who is a lion. Here's the problem. How do we know what lion it represents? Because people would automatically just assume, well, C.S. Lewis was a Christian, so he must be talking about Jesus. Oh, really? What about the devil 
who walks about as a roaring lion, as one. He's masquerading. He appears to be. He is doing what he said in Isaiah 14, I will be like the Most High. People are going to worship him. People are going to worship a lion. And they think they're worshiping Jesus. In Revelation 9, we have these beasts coming up out of the earth. They have the teeth of lion. In Revelation chapter 13, um, the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. It's another Jesus. See, the other Jesus kind of looks like a lion too. And if you're sober and you've girded up the loins of your mind with the truth of the Word of God, and you're watching unto prayer, you're going to know that this lion in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, is not Jesus Christ. It's another lion, another Jesus. And a drunken spirit led you there took you over there. Titus chapter 2 verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live how? Soberly, righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Here again, he's telling you that we should live soberly, and righteously. Why? So that we can look for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing. See, the Bible's telling us that when that day comes, and you know how the Bible says, you know, it's going to come as a thief in the night. Oh, boy. But the Bible tells us who are children of the day that that day will not overtake us as a thief. You know why? Because we're not drunk. We're sober. We're awake. We haven't had our pineal gland activated by a shakti pot and fallen backward as dead, slain in the spirit. And I, and I say this to all the people who are watching this who have had that experience. I say this not to tell you that there is no hope for you and you cannot ever be saved. There's been a, scores, hundreds, thousands of people who have come out of all kinds of false practices, whether it be in Christianity or whether it be in any other religion, the New Age movement. They've all come out of that and they've accepted that the Word of God is where the Spirit of God dwells. And they've, they've walked away from all their past experiences. This is what I'm asking you to do, to at least consider and pray and ask God, God, show me. Show me in the Bible. This thing that I've done, slain in the Spirit, can you show it to me in the Bible? Can I justify it as the real work of the Spirit of God in the Scriptures? That's all I'm asking you to do. And if you realize that it's not biblical, it's not scriptural. Ask God to deliver it from you. He will. He won't turn you away. I promise you he won't. He's a good God. Look at Isaiah 29.9. We're going to start getting an idea of what this spirit of drunkenness is all about. Isaiah 29, verse 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. Now look at verse 10. We're going to see what they're drunk with. The Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and hath closed your eyes the prophets and your rulers the seers hath he covered isn't it interesting that in the same places where you have all these shakti pots and these um, uh, slain in the spirit things and these manifestations you always have these latter day prophets oh God's showing me this oh God's giving me that you know what God's done with these guys and these ladies? He's closed the book on them. He's covered that. So now what they're seeing is a lie. It's not true. And people fall for it. And God said they're drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. What are they drunken and stagger with? A spirit. Another spirit. Not the real spirit of God. And so where did this spirit come from? Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 7. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. Stop right here. Back in verse 10 of Isaiah 29, he said, The Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep. Who poured it out? 
God did. What does he say about Babylon? Mystery Babylon, Jeremiah 51. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. What? Why did God do People People would look at that. They might look at it and say, See, it's from God. Praise Jesus. I'm drunk. No. This is a judgmental spirit that God pours out on you. You know why? Bible schmeibel. I don't need the Bible. I don't need the Word. I have the Spirit dwelling in me. I have I can be drunk. I can prophesy, see visions. I've had my pineal gland activated. Now I'm awakened. I don't need the word. I don't need this Bible that contains God. That that binds him up. And so you know what thousands and thousands and thousands of people have done is they've rejected the word of God, and as a result of that, God poured out onto them, into them, a drunken spirit. Look at what he says after that. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad, which means they're crazy. They're, they're like they're insane. They can't think right. And then he said, Babylon is suddenly what? Fallen and destroyed. Whew. Stop right here. God is showing you right here what happens when he pours out a spirit of drunkenness on you. You stagger. You can't, the, you can't understand the Bible. The seers hath he covered. And now you fall. All I'm asking you to do is go to the scriptures and ask God. God, show me slain in the spirit, please, if it's real. Do, do what I did. I went in that church and I said, God, if this is real. And God knew I wasn't playing games. God, if this is real, fine. If not, you protect me from it. And he did. Not because of any good thing I've done, I guarantee you. But I asked God, God, don't let me have this. Please don't. So you consider now what you've read, what you've heard from the scriptures. A drunken spirit is poured out upon people whom God judges and he covers up the words of the scriptures so they can't see right and you're being lied to by false prophets. And then when that happens, Babylon falls. Just pray about it. Isaiah 28.1. Notice how, we're going to notice how this drunkenness is associated with not being able to understand what the Bible says. And so you say, ah, we don't need that old King James. We can't understand it anyway. Think about this. We need a new King James Bible. Why? We can't understand this one. And I, if I've heard this one time, I've heard it a thousand times from preachers all over the place going, you see, you really can't understand the King James. What does that mean then? There's a spirit. See, the real spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, will draw you into this book and you'll understand it. You'll know, you'll perceive it, you'll get it. Because it's a spiritual book. The author is there. He's, he's on standby waiting to answer your questions. But when God pours out a false spirit, a drunken spirit, another spirit, and you receive it, all of a sudden now, well, I can't understand the King James Bible. So I'm going to get me one of them newfangled ones with all the verses missing and where the doctrine of the Godhead has been taken out and prayer and fasting and lordship of Christ and blood and hell and all that stuff and sodomy. Think about it. So we're going to look at it. Isaiah 28.1, Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. My, my, my. You know what? I'm going to stop here. I'm going to show you what that means. Whose glorious beauty is a fading flower. The drunkards of Ephraim, they exalt now. Their glorious beauty is a fading flower. I'm going to show you what that is. Because 99 out of 100 preachers, ministers, evangelists, scholars, lecturers, teachers, whatever, have abandoned the doctrine of the incorruptibility of the Word of God for a doctrine that says we believe the Bible was inspired in the original autographs, 
but it has faded away over time. Look at what Isaiah 40 said. Um, the voice said, um, verse 7, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth. Because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. God has poured out a spirit, uh, to the drunkards of Ephraim. They drank this cup willingly. They said, we believe the fading, fl- we believe the Bible was a beautiful flower at one time, but it faded away. That's what they said. And that's what their glorious beauty is. So he said in Isaiah 28, verse 7, they have also have erred through wine. It means they have error. Stop, stop, stop right here. We believe the Bible was inspired in the original autographs. But we now know that there's errors in the Bible. They have also erred through wine. You see, the real Spirit of God, praise the Lord, the real Spirit of God will convince you that this Bible's right 100% of the time. Everything that it says is right. A false spirit will have you looking for mistakes in it. Oh, oh, look, there's errors right here. Oh, look, there's errors. I think that was an error. I don't think they translated that right. I think that is a, I think that is a copyist error. I think over time, part of that manuscript got corrupted. What spirit is that? It's not the Holy Spirit. They have also erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Just like a drunk person. But now we're looking at a spirit, and it's the spirit of false doctrine. False doctrines about salvation. False doctrines about Jesus, who he really is, what he looks like, what he did. False doctrines about the Bible. We believe the Bible is inspired in the original autograph. See, it sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Oh, see, they believe the Bible. No, they don't. They believe now it has errors in it. And nowhere in the Bible does it teach you that the Bible would ever have errors in it. In fact, Peter said it was incorruptible. said never, never does the Bible ever have errors. Never. Never has. Never will. The real Bible. And so they are out of the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They're out of the way, which means that the way that they're in is not leading to the real Jesus and the real gospel. The way that they're leading people is is through a different spirit to a different Jesus and a different gospel. And I'm I'm gonna show you this when we get into the part of the gospel part. Every version of the gospel that has a work attached to it is the false gospel. There's only one true gospel. That is salvation by grace through faith. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever doeth. No, 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 no. It doesn't say that. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the real gospel. Believe and ye live. The Old Testament was do, and you live. And you and I both know there are groups out there that are desperately trying to get the sheep of God back into the Old Testament for salvation. It won't work. It's a different gospel. It's a different spirit leading them there. So they stumble in judgment. They err in vision. In other words, they're so drunk they can't, they can't read the Bible. Oh, what does that say? So they close it up. Oh, I want to hear from God directly. That's what they're doing. Leviticus 10, 9. Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. God's pretty serious about this. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between clean and unclean. Now I want you to get this, and we've established this already. The real Spirit of God will show you who the real Jesus is. When you're drunk, you cannot put difference between the clean Jesus and the dirty Jesus. Between the holy Jesus 
and the unholy Jesus. You can't tell the difference. You're going to mess up and get the wrong Jesus. Why? By being led by a drunken spirit. I, I talked about these revelings in drunkenness. Uh, there's all kinds of videos floating around on YouTube. Don't take you long to find them. But here's just a couple clips here. Uh, see all these people rolling on the floor, dead, unconscious, drunk. It's not the Holy Spirit. Here's an image here in the middle. Kenneth Hagin being, having to be held up by two of his uh, henchmen. Kenneth Copeland over there with his mouth wide open. Same spirit. This took place... I'm pretty sure at Life Christian Church, which is in Fenton, Missouri, I don't think the church exists anymore, but just not too far from here. Kenneth Hagin comes there, Copeland, and all these people show up, and they're having a big wingding drunk fest. Copeland, you can find this video on YouTube. Kenneth Hagin uh, going around telling everybody, "Be drunk, drunks fall down." <laughs> And at the end of it is an absolute reveling where Hagen and, uh, or excuse me, Copeland and all of the, and uh, all of Hagen's henchmen down on the floor with their bodies all over one another look like sodomites laying there, drunken, pounding their flesh against one another. It's not the real spirit of God. It is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And they tell you, oh, you got to be drunk like us. And people fall for it. What a shame. What a shame. They can have something a whole lot better than that. Through the pages of the Bible. And just like drunks, they won't wake up the next day and have regrets. Revelings, things such as the Toronto Blessing. Pensacola outpouring. Look up videos of what happens when people receive a sozo blessing. Bethel Church, Redding, California, Bill Johnson. I, I, I referred to him as the, the, that church is the anti-Bethel. There's the real Bethel, our church, and the anti-Bethel. And I say that because everything they do is the exact opposite of what we're trying to do here. They disdain the Word of God. They're going for the new Word of God. They're drunk. We choose to be sober here, including we don't put beer in our refrigerator at home and whiskey bottles under our, in the cab of our truck. The, all of the, and, and this Bill Johnson thing is running all over the country. It's a new outpouring. Started out with John Arnott, I think, up in Toronto, the uh, airport church, Vineyard Church. Vineyard, think about it. The Vineyard Church up in Toronto. Then it poured out to Pensacola. Now people's going all over the country to Pensacola to get this outpouring. And you can see the videos on YouTube, the drunken manifestations, people losing consciousness, people acting immodest. That is not the Spirit of God. Slain in the Spirit activities and things like that, that is not the real Spirit of God. But now Bethel Church, right in California, has sort of taken over. Uh, and then you have uh, Todd Bentley, who we talked about being part of Joel's army. And all of the manifestations. And then we have, uh, who is this? John Crowder. Token the ghost. Ooh, I'm getting a Holy Ghost, man. That is, that's blasphemy. It is absolutely blasphemy. Are they blaspheming the Holy Ghost? I don't know, but I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. Not for a second. Any altered states of consciousness. Animal manifestations. Animal manifestations. People barking and howling and making sounds of animals coming. What? Those are beasts. I'm telling you. Spirits manifest themselves. And you just take a look at what the person's doing. And then you understand the spirit that's manifesting in them. And the Bible calls it revelings. And it's given you evidence that it's not the Holy Spirit of God. It is the spirit that now worketh in the children of, the dis of disobedience, works of the flesh. Let's look at what the Bible, how the Bible talks about Babylon. Revelation 17, 1, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, 
I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So, so he, you know what? Let me stop right here. Most people know that uh, if you um, if you like committing adultery or you want to, you're kind of at a place and you want to talk a woman into coming home with you, give her some wine. Okay, give her some wine. Get her loosened up. She'll be a whole lot more into the deal. I mean, that's just how it works. People, they drink. They don't make the right choices. They run around on their wives or their husbands because of it. So it's the wine of her fornication. And so he carried me away into the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names, a blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So here we have the beast who brings in this drunken spirit. Revelation 17, 4. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her head was a name written, Mystery. Bab- I want you to think about that. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She's called mystery because mystery has to do with not knowing. When you're drunk, you don't know. There is a, there's a YouTube video of a pastor's wife at the Pensacola outpouring who cannot remember. She's so drunk in the spirit, she cannot remember where she's from. She has to ask her husband, Honey, where are we from? I think we've used that in one of our videos, uh, The Holy Bible Sure What a Prophecy. Um, Paul Creek Ministries has, uh, the, I think, the original there, and they've got it in one of their videos. And I'm telling you, that's a spirit of drunkenness. It's a mystery. You can't Drunk people, they don't know who they are. They don't know where they live. They can't drive an automobile. We don't let people who are drunk drive an automobile. Why? They're dangerous. We shouldn't let preachers be drunk behind the pulpit either. They're dangerous. They're going to kill people is what they're going to do. Literally, they're going to slay them. They're going to murder them in the spirit. Stay away from this stuff. But that spirit, and instead of the Holy Spirit coming on you, giving you illumination as to what the Word of God means and what it says and how to, how to interpret it and how to read it and how to understand it, know who the real Jesus is and the, know all the doctrines of the faith, this spirit is a mystery spirit. When you're, it gives you a drunken spirit and now you don't know, but you don't care. That's the thing. And so you, you start hearing all these people talking about, oh, we don't get into doctrine. We get into the spirit. You know what it is? They're drunk, they don't know, and they don't care. And that's how they want you to be. Oh, don't, don't come at me with doctrine. Come to me with the Spirit. Oh, it's a good feeling. They don't know, and they don't care. That's what they want for you. Revelation seventeen seven. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery. See, stop right here. When the Holy Spirit, the real Spirit of God, is on you, you understand the mystery. It's not a mystery anymore. And how how is this mystery revealed to us? Did we go, oh, I'm getting a revelation. Oh, God's downloading it into me right now. We we just we read it out of the out of the Bible. That's how we know the mystery. I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Now, here's something that's real interesting. With Christ, the real Jesus, the Spirit brings us to Christ. That's what we saw in John 16. He will speak of me. The Spirit brings us to Christ. With the other Jesus, the other Jesus, the Antichrist, the devil, brings the Spirit to you. It's the opposite. It's the other way around. The exact opposite. So, let's ask the question. What, what is the purpose of this other spirit? Why, why is God using, why, is, why does God pour out the, the mystery of Babylon, the spirit of drunkenness to the entire world? Why is it that, there's, there church, that there are churches that are involved in these extramarital affairs against God? Why are there churches that have these manifestations of drunkenness and revelings and false doctrine and things like that. What is her purpose? How does she work? 
Well, we studied from the scriptures that the real spirit will convict us of sin. It will draw us to Jesus. It will show us things to come and, and show us things out of the word. Mystery Babylon, and she is seen in several places in the scriptures. She's always a, um, always a female, a female character in the Bible. Think of, think of female characters in the Bible that you think would qualify as Mystery Babylon. You're probably right. But what is her role? What is her job? What is it that she's supposed to do? Let's look at the scriptures. Number one, Genesis 39, 7. We find out that she is a seducer. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lascivious. First one. It's the first one. This was Potiphar's wife. She was married to Potiphar. Potiphar trusted Joseph so much that he hardly ever came home. So he's gone out doing business, doing politics or whatever it is. Joseph's running his whole household. And there's his wife. There's Potiphar's wife all alone. And she's looking at this young, handsome Joseph. She probably, you know, she probably got a wine glass in one hand, cigarette in the other. She goes up to Joseph, lie with me. She's a seducer. What does the Bible say? Seducing spirits. Proverbs 12, 26. The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduceth them. The way of the wicked. The wicked is the Antichrist. His spirit is a seducing spirit. Ezekiel 13, 10. Because even because they have seduced my people, saying peace, and there was no peace, and one built up a wall, and others daubed it with untempered mortar. Think of a wall that falls. Jericho. Okay, see, that's, that's your type, that's your story, that's your picture. Here we have wicked, a wicked spirit will seduce people. Here we have the prophets seducing people. Oh, come on over. We have better music in our church. We turn the lights down. We have coffee and donuts. You can have all this stuff. And by the way, we're going to talk about sex on Sunday. They're seducing people into their churches. It's another spirit. Mark 13, 22, for false Christ and false prophets shall rise and show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. 1 Timothy 4, 1, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Here he's, now he's connected it. Why are they seducing you? To teach you different doctrine. What's doctrine? The gospel. They're going to seduce you into believing another gospel. And just remember, and we talked about this last week, the whore, she'll tell you whatever you want to hear. She will. She'll tell you whatever you want to hear. You pay the money. You get seduced. You find out that her steps lead to hell. And you fell for it. 2 Timothy 3.13 But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving, being deceived. 1 John 2.26 These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. You know what the antidote is to a seducing spirit? These things that are written. That's, that's how you get inoculated against a seducing spirit. That's, that's how when you start hearing these false doctrines and you somebody on Facebook said, oh, you gotta, you gotta, I gotta show you this, this, got, watch this video, go see this, oh, I'm following this, and oh, this is so great. And you learn the Bible. And you watch that, and then you write back, um, that's unbiblical, that's wrong. Well, you're judging, and you know how the people on Facebook, you're judging me, how come you blah, blah, blah. And then you got to unfriend somebody, or you got to block them. Because they're going to come at you, brother or sister. They're going to tear you apart. Why? Because these things are written so that people won't seduce you into believing false doctrine. And you read the Bible. And then some guy's got some new teaching says, Oh, you gotta, you got to be slain in the Spirit. Oh, you got to have this. Oh, you got to go back and keep the Torah. you got to keep all the law. And you got to do the Passover cedar, which is not biblical. You've, most, of the, most of the activities, 
I, I kind of did my homework. Everybody said, well, you got to keep the Passover. And we had a Passover cedar at our church. I looked at the rituals involved in the Jewish Passover cedar. Most of them don't come out of the Bible. Why should I do that? Where did they come from? I'm not doing that. I don't know where it came from. But these people are trying to seduce you into telling you that you're going to lose your salvation if you don't follow their direction and fall under their command. They're trying to seduce you. The inoculation to a seducing spirit is the written text to the Word of God. It's that simple. These things have I written to you concerning them that seduce you. Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman, oh, there she is. Look at there. He even gives her a name. Jezebel. The word Baal is in that name. Bel. Which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Jezebel, number one, she calleth herself. She's self-appointed. God didn't call her. Number two, she seduces my servants to commit fornication. Come on in, big fellas. I'll show you a good time in the spirit and to eat things sacrificed in the idols. That is, I, I believe, and I, I can't say it 100% yet, eating things sacrificed in the idols, I think it has everything to do with receiving the mark the right hand or forehead. I can't prove it, so whatever. Just forget I said it. But I think that's where it's leading to. Those, that's one of the four things that the Jerusalem Council told the Gentile church not to do. But here we have this seductive spirit, to seduce my spirits to commit fornication. I'm going to put this up on the screen. I hate doing this, but this is what it looks like. All these sermon series, stripped, red hot, whatever. New Victoria's Secrets, the intimacy series. That's sick. That's, that's absolutely sick. Ed Young Jr., several years ago, put a bed up on the stage and said, sex is worship. That's, that's ridiculous. He then, uh, last year, gets up on, on this bed, him and his wife, on the roof of their church, TV cameras everywhere for 24 hours, they're laying in bed together, which, that's, that's awful. Then tells everybody, he's got a new sermon series, he's going to teach them how to put more romance in the relationship and, and do this seven times, one day a week in a different place in the house. It's lasciviousness and it's ritualism too. It's ritualism, tantric magic that he's, that he's seducing people into falling for. You, you want to have a better marriage? Number one, read this Bible. Find out your role in the marriage from God. Number two, ask God to bless your marriage according to what's in the Bible. You'll, ha you'll have an absolutely outstanding marriage. God will bless you all the way around. You don't need this junk. It's seducing people. It's another spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. So you have to ask yourself the question, the preachers who put this stuff on, what spirit are they being led by? And if it's not the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't sit another second in that church. Not, I would not do it. They're setting you up, people. They're setting you up. The Bible said so. Now, that's, that's the first thing. That her job, Mystery Babylon's role, is to seduce. So you have people in a, in a Bible-believing church. Believe the Bible. Preach the Bible. Preach hard against sin. Then you got all these mega churches rising up all over town. And all these charismatic stuff and all the signs and wonders that are going on and all the rock bands and the light shows and the coffee shops and everything like that and the fact that if you'll come to our church you can wear your shorts and you can you know you can wear your sandals and you can dress like a bum you can go like people go to Walmart you can keep your pajama pants on you can go into the house of God and we're not going to preach anything against what you're doing we're going to make you feel good come on over to our side see they're seducing you I want to make it sound real good now. Come on over to our side. And so you know what happens? One person after another leaves the fundamental Bible-believing church and goes to the fornication church. They seduced them over there. Now here's another aspect of that. Whores, why do they do what they do? Money. 
Judges chapter 16, verse 4, And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Enti Look here, entice him. And see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. There were five of these lords of the Philistines, so 5,500 pieces of silver. That's a huge chunk of change. It was back then. It probably is still even now. Man, if I had 5,500, 5,500 silver coins, I would at least have $5,500 silver dollars. But that's what they, they, they hired her. She, she's for hire. She'll do whatever her master tells her to do. See, the five lords of the Philistines represent death. They represent the curse of the law and all that stuff. She's going to do what they hired her to do. They went to give her the money. She said, forget you. We'll give you 5,500 pieces of silver. I'm your gal. Now you know how to, now you know how to talk. Entice him. And see, here's what they're trying to do. Look at what they're trying to do. They want her to entice Samson so that they can find out how to get his strength away from him so they can kill him. The seven locks of Samson's hair correspond to the seven spirits of God and the word of God purified seven times. Delilah, here's what we want you to do. We'll pay you money. Get, get the Bible off of, get, get God's power off of Samson so we can destroy him. And they did it for money. And I'm telling you, there are hireling pastors out there all over the place that they, they will not say what's in this book. You know why? Because they're getting paid too well to not say it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have, look at here, erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. It's right. See, this Bible is so right. It identifies these false spirits and these false preachers and these false churches. They're all about the experiences, the signs and wonders. They're all about seducing. And it's all about money. Oh, we've got, oh, we've got a great teaching of the Holy Spirit that will, will help you overcome everything in the world. For your love offering of $399.95 plus $50 postage and handling, we'll give it to you. They were hired to seduce God's people to strip them away of the real power that they had in the Word of God so the devil could conquer them. Works. It's going on every day. See these churches? The mega churches. Joel Osteen. Humongous churches. That's Creflo Dollar. That's his mugshot, by the way. He got arrested. That's his house. That's, that's the dollar house. Now... If I was going to go out and try to swindle God's people out of all their money, I would change my name from Dollar. I promise you I would. I would not be called Creflo Dollar or Freddie Price. I, w I wouldn't do that. Okay. But the mega churches, the multi-millions of dollars that are poured into these humongous ministries, money from all over the world coming in, and there's Joel, and he's just like a good harlot. He'll tell you what you want to hear. And he's doing it for money. And everybody knows it. Now they call it, they call that gain godliness. It's a different spirit. It's not the real one. You remember the prophet of God? When Naaman offered him all of that stuff, he said, no, I don't want it. Go dip in the River Jordan seven times. His, his servant, Gehazi, saw that, saw him, uh, uh, yeah, I can't remember. He was, saw Naaman leave with all that stuff. Got to thinking about it. Went and chased after him. And said, uh, uh, Naaman, uh, my, my, my Lord changed his mind. Can we, you know, 
We had the, gave him the stuff. He ended up with Naaman's leprosy. There's a judgment. There's a judgment for these guys. I mean, it looks like it looks like they're getting away with it. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs concerning all these big mega churches and how they look? And I used to have a real problem with it. God said, "Lust not after her beauty." Don't don't look at their churches and go, "Boy, Mike, you you, you could have something like that." You see, that's before God really dealt with me by, I mean, almost beating me to a pulp. That was in my mind. I wanted, to, I wanted to be the cool guy that had the mega church so I could have money. I know how it works. Um, let's look at Jezebel for a minute. Second Kings chapter 9, verse 22. It came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many? Now, we're going to go back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Notice that witchcraft, idolatry, hatred, and so on, is along with adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. So I want you to think about this and think about what the Bible's telling you. Here we have a picture, another picture of Mystery Babylon the Great, her spirit. Uh, we saw earlier that she was um, the, the wife of, of, of Potiphar. Uh, we saw also that she was Delilah. She did it for money. So they err from the faith and so on. They take away the power of God through the written word of God. And then we have, we have Jezebel now who brings with her witchcraft. And that's what Jehu said. He said, there's not going to be any peace so long as, as thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. Witchcraft is a, re the, 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 a rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, the Bible says. Anytime you have a rebellious spirit in the church. Anytime you have uh, pastors who rebel against the authority of the Word of God, they're going to bring in witchcraft. People, I cannot express to you how important it is for your pastor to be preaching out of the Bible. If he's not... He's going to be bringing another gospel, which is going to look like witchcraft. It's already happening everywhere. And that's how you spot the other spirit. If it brings in witchcraft, you know what witchcraft is? It is works-based blessing, performance-based blessing. That's what witchcraft is. Witchcraft says if you do this and you perform this and you say this the right way, then, the, then God is going to give you such and such blessing. God is going to pour out unto you. God's going to fix this. God's going to do that. So the other spirit is a spirit of witchcraft that leads to another gospel that has works or performance built into it. That's not the same gospel. So look at this. Roman Catholicism is loaded with ritualism. Perform this. Hold the crucifix like this. Put your hands out like this. Say these Latin words. Turn, magically turn this cookie into God and eat it. So you can, be, you can have God in you. You can receive Jesus because we have performed a ritual that turns this wafer into Jesus. Now you can receive Jesus, but it's only temporary. You've got to come back and get some more of it later. Oh, by the way, we're going to crucify him again next week. So come back. Don't miss it. Roman Catholicism is one of the greatest repositories of Mystery Babylon that there exists in the entire world. Roman Catholicism. Witchcraft. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations. There is countless similarities between Roman Catholicism and the ancient mystery religions of the past. Even go, go to Catholic Church, you hear them talk about all oh, the mystery of the Eucharist, the mystery of this, and the, it's the mystery of the gospel. The mystery. They talk about all the time talking about the mystery, the mystery, the mystery. They don't tell you what it is. They've got something they're hiding, they're covering up. By the way, I got to go back to this. You're going to you're going to see this. Okay? Revelation chapter 2, Jezebel seduces the servants of God to eat things sacrificed to idols. That's the Roman Catholic mass. They have seduced billions of Catholics into eating this thing that was sacrificed in front of an idol. There it is right there. 
Now you know what it looks like. Ritualism. People have been asking, I talked about this, I have a video called Witchcraft in the Church. And I featured this, the circle maker. I, in fact, this is what provoked me to do it. Here's this guy coming out, and he's, he's telling an unbiblical story about a Jewish guy in the, in the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and New Testament that decided he wasn't going to budge until God did something and made it rain, so he drew a circle and he stood in it. And he stayed there and stayed there, and so he performed until God blessed him. It's witchcraft. And so here, this guy, he's made this, he's got a big thing going now. He's got books and videos, and churches now are bringing this in. We're going to draw circles now, this, and we're going to do circles of this. And everybody, everybody now, we're going we're gonna to pray in it. We're going to walk around in a big circle. We're going to bring God in. We're going to perform so that God will bless his people. I, I started hearing, I started hearing years ago, uh, teachers, youth pastors, pastors, talking about uh, worship is essential. You, God is going to be in your worship. You want God to bless you. you. You must worship Him. You want God to do this and save you. You must worship Him. The, the wonder, no reason why, uh, the reason why you don't have things in your life and things fall because you won't worship God. You know what they're doing? They're setting people, and it took me a long time to figure this out. I'm going, boy, something don't sound right about that. But I kept hearing preachers all over the place saying the same thing. What they're setting you up for is to teach you that if you perform certain worship practices and you do this and you close your eyes in the worship service and you raise your hand, this is why they tell everybody now in the worship service, now stand up now, come on, woo, clap your hands, come on, get it together. They start out with the, with the fast beat songs, getting everybody to sway into the music, and then they, then they bring it down to a lull and they get everybody now emotional and their, their mind is starting to shut down a little bit, bringing them to an alpha state. And so now they're lulled. And they said, you see, now you perform this. If you do this now, God's going to come in. God's going to do this. It's a setup. It's witchcraft. It's ritualism. Am I against worship God? Absolutely not. The Bible teaches us to worship Him in Psalms, hymns, but it tells us to worship Him in spirit, leave our flesh out of it, and in truth. You see, the reason why He told us that is that Jesus knew, in fact, Jesus told us, when you pray, don't use vain repetitions. Most praise and worship music is all about the repetition of the song, saying it over and over and over again. I was at a youth camp, and they, they started doing this, let it rain, let it rain, open the floodgates of heaven, and I'm going, boy, just something don't sound right. And they, they, sang, that, they sang that same phrase, I kid you not, 20, 25 times, 30 times, over and over and over and over and over. And Jesus said, don't do that. They that worship God must worship Him in spirit, not in the flesh. The performance and the works of the flesh and hand gestures and doing all this and, and all the things they tell you to do, that's not worshiping God. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The Kabbalah. The Kabbalah is witchcraft. It's like opposites. It's part of another Jesus. I'm going to do an in-depth teaching sometime on Kabbalah and show you that that's where the Hebrew Roots movement is taking you because all these guys who are leaders of the Hebrew Roots, Staley and Michael Rood and Peter Micus and all these other guys, they learned their ways at the, at the feet of Jewish rabbis who are steeped in the Kabbalah, whether they knowingly or unknowingly learned from the Zohar and from the Kabbalah, Jewish witchcraft. They're now teaching it. And that's why they're trying to take everybody back to the Torah. Because the Kabbalah teaches that there is a special magic and a secret inside the Torah. That if you say God's name, if you say this, you say the Tetragrammaton, the sacred name or witchcraft, that's what we talked about. You say the name right and then God performs and God acts on your behalf if you say it right. That's witchcraft. And it's being brought into the church. They are seducing. Jezebel is seducing people with witchcraft. You perform, God will bless. That's not the real gospel. You have part of, there's a part of it, witchcraft called the law of attraction, where thoughts 
become things. Use the law of attraction to create the life you desire. That's, that's witchcraft. Is what it, the law of attraction is witchcraft. If you think all, you must force your mind into thinking all the good thoughts, then your mind transfers that to your mouth, and then you speak these things over areas of your life. And, and you've, I don't know if you've seen people doing this, but this, I pronounce wealth now over my household. I pronounce health over my child. And they say you have to believe it first, and then you speak it. I pronounce this, and I pronounce that, and I declare this, and I declare that. Witches do that all the time. People who are following the secret, which they're, they're following the law of attraction, are told to do this. They first met, must meditate and empty their mind of all negative thoughts and then begin to proclaim and speak blessings over, and speak wealth and speak business contacts and speak this and speak that over everything. Here's Joyce Meyer with a book called Power Thoughts. She says, I really believe power thoughts has the power to change your life if, if, if you'll apply the 12 principles in this book. In other words, if you perform and do what I tell you to do, then it will transform your life. But if you don't, it won't work. And you say, well, isn't that Christianity? No. You see, I believe what God said, and I just ask God to perform it for me. Oh, I don't know if I believe that, Pastor. I believe that. Here's the thief on the cross. Can't do anything. But the Bible says if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the thief on the cross, and he believes in his heart that God will raise Jesus from the dead even though he hasn't died yet because he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he already called him Lord. And so he's in heaven today. Witchcraft, power thoughts. Here's Joel Osteen. I declare 31 promises to speak over your life. You know what that is? Witchcraft. Jezebel's moved in into the mega multi-million dollar church. By the way, this book can be yours for $13.67. You know why? Because the whore ain't giving it until you pay. That's why. You think about it. You think about where she is. That's how you recognize her spirit. She has a price tag. She'll cause you to eat food sacrificed to idols. And she'll teach you how to do witchcraft. How to say things and do things so that you can get stuff out of God. It's witchcraft. And then we have labyrinths. The performance of... And it, it's kind of funny because even while I'm telling you this and, you know, the, the thing was up on the screen, I'm, I'm taking my pen and I'm, tra I'm tracing the, the maze, you know, because this is what we do. But they put, these, they put these labyrinths in churches. Here's Sardis Baptist Church, a spiritually progressive community of faith. They put these things inside churches and say, now, if you walk this, if you walk through this thing, You'll get to the center, and you'll you'll find God there in the center. It's witchcraft, and they're and she's teaching and seducing the servants of God to do these things. Now, and and I'm going to talk a little bit more about what these mazes and what these labyrinths represent right out of the Bible. I'll show it to you, and you can recognize what spirit it is. But here's here's the the biggest thing with Jezebel, and I want you to really get a hold of this. Okay. 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 5. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give my, thee my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread and let thine heart be arise. Think about that now. And eat bread and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Now, this story is so full of biblical truth. And I think every, every true believer of God needs to go back and look at this and think about what vineyards are. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. The Bible talks about uh, and so, so we know that it's we know that it's, salvation is on the line here. 
And in teaching that, Jesus said, He that abideth me and my words abide in him. The same shall bring forth much fruit. Remember, the fruit of the Spirit. But he said, you know, if you don't, if you don't do those things, if you don't abide in me, and by the way, Jesus never told the vine to produce fruit. He told him to bear the fruit. It's the vine that produces the fruit. That's the difference. And so if the words are abiding in you, you're abiding in Christ, and you will, you will bring forth fruit. You don't have to. You don't have to produce it. God's going to just bring it forth. And so the opposite of that is those vines that were, are not fruitful, they're cut down, cast into the fire. Big, 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 beautiful illustration here. So here is, here is the vineyard that Naboth has. It represents what he's inherited. It represents uh, eternal life. It represents, um, represents the Word of God, which has been handed down to us and preserved over this time. And that's what See, the vineyard that Naboth had, he didn't buy that at the realtor's office. His father gave that to him. You know where his father got it? His, his father. You know where he got it? His father. You know where they got it? They got it when, when God gave them that parcel of land back in the book of Joshua. When God gave them that parcel of land and said, keep it in your family forever. Don't sell it. So Naboth was telling Ahab, right, I, Ahab, I can't sell it. God said, no. I have to keep this. My son, I don't have a son yet. My, whenever I have a son, I, he's got to have this vineyard. I'm going to give it to him. So he can live, so he can he won't be a slave to anybody. He won't be a servant. He'll have he'll have land that he can live on. Ahab said, I want it. Naboth said, I'm sorry, Ahab, I know you're the king, but God said you can't have it. And so Jezebel said, I'll get it for you. Jezebel represents the transfer. You know what? Let me let me do this. Let's bring out my little army man here. Okay. Here is a, a soldier of the living God. And his life, is, he has chosen to put his life under the authority of the Word of God. Here is the age of Aquarius. Jezebel stands over here, and she's seducing him. And she's telling him, come on over here. Come on. Lust not after her beauty, but he lusts after her beauty... Now he's going to hell. Plain and simple. Okay? He he walked away from the dominion of the word of God over him. Gone to the other side. Okay? And so here is here is the vineyard, which represents God's authority. It represents God's blessing over you. The transfer of dominion is going to take place here. We're going to take we're going to take the vineyard. And we're going we're gonna to put it under the authority of Ahab rather than Naboth. So I want you to think about that. The church, the church, people in churches, I'll say it that way, people in churches who are supposed to be under the authority of the Word of God. Jezebel has now succeeded in getting them over out of the authority of God to the authority of principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places. That's how it works. Isaiah 14, 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Notice the mount of the congregation. That's a church word. Ezekiel 28, 2. Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Look at it. The devil's whole, what, what he wants is to sit in dominion and authority over the inheritance of God's people. To rule over it. To own it. He looks at the Ark of the Covenant and says, I want to be king. I want to sit where God is. So I'm going to try to destroy God. I'm going to try to get God to break his promise, his covenant. I'm going to try to destroy mankind so I can sit in the seat where God is sitting. That's what he wants. 2 Thessalonians 2, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The temple of God, right here. This is the vineyard. And now the devil, Ahab 
wants to take it over. Naboth refuses. Jezebel says, I'll get it. So, you know, just think of a church. How they used to do that. Here's the church and here's the steeple, okay? Think of a church that at one time, your church, the church you used to go to, can't go to anymore, at one time was under the direction of the Holy Spirit by way of the Word of God. You see, the old timers knew that when the Spirit moved, it was going to be according to Scripture. The devil wants all those people inside that church. How's he going to do it? Well, God's got dominion over them right now, and so he can't have them. So he gets Jezebel to pull those people out of God's protection and God's dominion and bring them over so that Ahab can rule over them. That's her job, and she's doing it quite well. The only, th the only thing she has to do, and it's actually a relatively simple thing, the only thing that she has to do is get the church and the preacher to go, oh, and she's done it very, very well. She's done it with all the people who say, I don't, I, I have the Spirit in me. I'm being led by the Spirit, not by some book. That's how she's doing it. Or by the preacher who says, well, I've studied and there's so many mistakes in the Bible. Let me just give you what the Spirit is telling me. So that's how it's done. That's how it works. Or, as I talk, talked about this in Sacred Name or Witchcraft, the Hebrew Roots Jezebel people and the Sacred Name people are trying to convince you that this is not the Word of God. So, the, you know what they're trying to do? They're trying to get you to go, oh, this is not the Word of God. Well, show me where it is. Well, it's in the original Hebrew. Oh, you don't know that? Well, let me tell you what it really says. See, it's a setup. They lied. They, they succeeded in taking people out from under the authority of this book. And, and really, that's what salvation is based on, right? Salvation is based on you believe. Well, they quit believing. They quit believing. They have an evil heart of unbelief. They departed from the living God. Now they're, the under, they're under the authority of Lucifer himself. Only he looks like a lion, and so they think it's Jesus. But it's not. It's a seducing spirit. Let me just talk briefly about dominion theology. We talked about this in um, the teaching on the number seven, the reclaiming seven mountains. Remember that Mystery Babylon sits in dominion over seven mountains. Okay? And that's what the Dominion movement is all about. Kingdom business, destiny weekend. You'll see Dominionism everywhere. Revelation 17, 9, here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So it has to do with who's going to be in authority, who's going to be in charge. Is it the Holy Spirit of God who, is, who is, should be in charge of you, who leads you and guides you and, and brings you in the way of God? Or is it a drunken spirit who leads you away from God? and has dominion over you. She tells you what to say. She tells you what to think. She tells you what to do, and you do it. Consider it like this. We have as the rule over our country a piece of paper with writing on it. It's called the Declaration of Independence. It starts out, we the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union. That is the written text upon which final authority rests in our country. No one is above the Constitution, not the President, not the judges, not the Congress. No one is above the authority that's on paper. No one is. No one's above the law. So watch how, watch how Jezebel works. She's good. Take a look at this graphic. You know what that's a picture of? The United Nations Council. Now, Jezebel has succeeded, and is, there's still some things left to do. But Jezebel has put such a spirit now in this country that there's a lot of people willing 
to turn over our sovereignty as an individual independent nation bound by the laws guaranteed and the rights guaranteed us by the Constitution, that piece of paper, to turn our rights and our sovereignty over to the collective, the United Nations. Who's in charge of the United Nations? There's an unseen force over the United Nations. There's soon to be a leader over them all. Ahab, Lucifer, to get the people out from under the dominion of the Constitution that protects us and gives us rights, like the right to keep and bear arms and the right to preach the gospel, to take us and put us over the dominion of the collective of the United Nations. That's Jezebel's job, and she's done it pretty well. Then we have we look at it like this. Here we have here we have God's people under the dominion of the Word of God. Her job through the denominations, through the councils, through the publishing companies, through the music, through the uh, evangelists, through the ministries, through the, everything like that, is to get, get you who can stand as a single individual and be saved and be born again and be a child of God and inherit the kingdom of God. You as an individual can be saved without the collective. You are a king and a priest with Jesus Christ. You will come back and rule and reign with him for a thousand years, and you don't need a collective to say that you're saved. You don't need that. The Bible tells you, these things have I written you, that you may know that you have eternal life. It's what John said. Her job, Jezebel's job, is to get you out from under this and put you under the authority of the collective, of the groups, of denominations. That at one time, denominations did a good job. But now the denominations at the highest levels, the people who work in the denominations at the highest levels are being led by a different spirit. Because they're the ones bringing in contemplative prayer. They're the ones bringing in all these rituals and works and worship and things like that that you must do in order to honor and please God. They're the ones who are bringing this stuff in. They're putting it in. They're publishing it. They're putting it in Sunday school quarterlies. They're putting it in their denominational literature and everything. And it's being given to them by a whore up at the top and promises these guys, these leaders, will pay you well. We'll pay you well. We'll take good care of you. We'll give you money and status and power if you'll go along with what we're telling you. And so they seduce the people of God to leave and abandon the Word of God in their churches and come under the direct line of what looks like the denomination. But actually now, there's someone that's ruling over the denominations. A centralized force ruling over them. I'm staying here. I'm not, I'm not moving. I'm not budging. And I'll say this to you, and I'm going to pick up on this, on this prospect next week as we move into it. If you're in a church and you can detect another spirit, you know what God says to you? Revelation 18, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. God says, come out. Come out. You're at, a, you're at the uh, Women of Faith Conference, or you're at the Promise Keepers Conference, or you're at the uh, Youth with a Mission Conference, or you're at the uh, uh, you know, Witness to That Guy Conference, or the Rock Concert, or whatever. You're sitting in your church, you go to the denominational meeting, and you've read the Bible. You've been inoculated. You know what seducing spirits look like and how they work and how they move and you see that what's going on there is not scriptural, it's not of the Bible, get out. Leave. Because there's one thing that I know about this other spirit, Mystery Babylon. God's going to judge her. He's going to judge her just like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. And if I were you, I'd get out of Sodom 
while the angels of God and the ministers of God are telling you it's time to leave. I would get out now. Your authority should be the Word of God. Now, I believe in earthly authorities. I believe in, I believe in, I'm a pastor. I'm a bishop over a church. But I, I, and every word that I say is subject to the written Word of God. And I believe in that. If you've got a good King James Bible preaching pastor that loves that book and loves to see people saved and, 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 and weeps over the Word of God, I think I'd stay with him. He starts bringing in this other spirit. Get out. Be not a partaker. We're going to talk more about this other spirit and how she's working through all the oneness groups and people joining together and the paradigm shifts and all the, all the change. Oh, everything's got to change. And then... We're going to talk about something that might shock you a little bit. You know what Shekinah is? If you already know, then praise the Lord. If you say, well, that, yeah, Shekinah, that's the presence of God. No, it's not. And before I say anything, if you haven't heard what I've taught on this already, go to this. All I'm going to ask you to do is go to the scriptures. And I'll even say, go to the Hebrew if you want to. And we'll talk about that. It's not in there. It's a different spirit. It's a setup. So Pastor Mike, I love you. Say these things because I love you. I love the truth. I want to know the truth. I'm still learning. I'm still growing in the Lord. But I put myself under the authority of this book. This book tells me what to say and what to believe. And the Spirit of God works through what's in this book. And I'm blessed by it. That's what I want for you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.